All right, let's take a look at chapter four in seminar 16. This one is wild. The diagrams alone are intense. Uh, let's earn them. I'm gonna move fast and loose through some of these materials, but in a way that brings us to some pretty decisive points toward the end of this lengthy and rather woolly seminar. So page one, let's just start at the beginning here. What Lacan is starting to work with here is the relationship of a signifier to an other signifier. Now this is interesting. In the English translation we have, that's a capital O, other signifier as S2, about five or six, seven lines down from the top of page one. It's this relationship, in other words, between an S1 and an S2. And you know the topology that he's talking about here. The signifier is what represents the subject, the signifier is S1, for another signifier. Here symbolized by S2, which we've been talking about. Lacan is still hot on this topic. Scroll down a little bit more on page one, and he wants to ask about this big other. Now, if you've seen our materials on 14, where we talked about this through four lengthy lectures and discussions, some of this is not going to be too big of a surprise for you until we get to the diagramming. Here in 16, Lacan is still very interested in what he calls the destiny of the big other. And in chapter four here, we're going to see why. This big other, the other enclosed, no knowledge that one can presume, let us say, will one day be absolute. On page one, he's giving us a vision of the other, the big O other, that does not enclose absolute knowledge, a big other that does not amount to the container of all things, in other words, absolute knowledge. This brings us back to that point in 14 that Lacan's been making ever since. The big other does not exist. Now we've talked about this, so we'll leave it at that for now. We're just getting into chapter four, and I want you to know these themes are top of mind for him. An other that would not have absolute knowledge among its contents. Notice on page two, he tells us, reiterating himself, that this is an important topic. First full paragraph on page two, that the big other should be put in question is extremely important for the continuation of our discourse. The discourse of psychoanalysis, perhaps? The discourse of psychoanalytic theory, which is to say a discourse without words? We'll see. There is not in this statement, let us say first, this statement that the other contains no knowledge that is either already there or to come in an absolute status. There is not in this statement anything subversive. Again, when Lacan gets into this stuff, just think about containers and things contained. The container is not among its contents. Remember the wastebasket, the wastebasket with which Seminar 16 began. The wastebasket is not among its contents. The refuse, household and otherwise, contained in the wastebasket. Among that refuse is not the wastebasket itself. The container is not among its contents. And that slippage is why there is no meta language, no other of the other, and so on. Again, we've been through this, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it. <clears throat> Lacan makes another point here on two that is worth noting. It's a point he's made before, um, and it's one that, that I think is, is pretty nicely stated here. It's toward the bottom of page two. Why should knowledge be subverted because it cannot be absolute? This is a great question, and it's one that, according to Lacan, this pretension, wherever it shows itself or wherever it is shown itself, is, it must be said, always laughable. So there's something hilarious to him about the idea that knowledge is subverted because it is not absolute. And his point is rather simple. There's a simple version of this and then a more complex part. Let's do them both quickly. Knowledge is incomplete but it's still operational. That's the simple point here. You don't know everything 
that's happening in your neighborhood right now. But the things you do know about what's happening in your neighborhood right now are still fully operational. You can operationalize the knowledge that you have, however limited, to do things in the world here in your neighborhood. Even and especially when it's incomplete, knowledge is operational. And that especially is the important part here, which brings us to the more complex insight here. It's in fact because knowledge is incomplete that it exists and remains operational. And this is that point about dysfunction that we talked about earlier, this point about faults and failures. A bucket with a hole in it is not as functional as one that doesn't have a hole in it, but a bucket with a hole in it can never be filled. It's function as a water containing entity can never be fully realized. It can just go on having water poured into it. Because it's leaky, it gets to continue bucketizing water. This is the more complex point that Lacan is making. Knowledge that is incomplete is still wildly operational. And in fact, here's that second point again, it's because it's incomplete that it is operational. Now, why is this so laughable? This pretension, wherever it shows itself, or wherever it has shown itself, this belief that because knowledge is incomplete, that it, it's subverted or inadequate or somehow dysfunctional beyond the point of use. It's laughable. Laughable precisely, we are here at the heart of our subject. <clears throat> I mean that this new start made in the witticism, insofar as it provokes laughter, it provokes laughter precisely in short, insofar as it is properly attached to the fault inherent in knowledge. So he's kind of messing around here. This pretension is laughable because it's precisely in the gaps of which knowledge is made that we see the opportunity for the witticism for the joke. Did you know that diarrhea is hereditary? It's true, it runs in your genes. We can walk this seminar forward up through pages three and four and into page five, which is a terrific page. And Lacan returns playfully again to this notion of the subversion of the subject. You've heard our lectures on this essay, you've read this essay, you know this essay is fire. And you've heard me say it before, but if I could only pick one essay in a Cree to offer to somebody, and I had to just pick one and the rest, I don't know, we're gonna burn in hell, I would have to pick the subversion of the subject essay. It's a terrifically complex and inclusive foundational introduction to Lacan's work, which is why the very start of Lectures on Lacan was a close reading of this essay in a clinical psychology doctoral seminar, no less. I think we had 70 or 80 people on the call. It was sick. Um, so many of them were Jungians, though. It was also sick in a different way. Here, though, what we're talking about, the subversion of the subject, Lacan's going to flip it around a little bit and say, what exactly does the subject subvert? It's not the subject that's being subverted here. What if the subject is the subverter? What exactly does it subvert? Middle paragraph, this big one that says, let us take things up again on page five. Check this out. The subversion that is at stake is the one that the subject introduces, certainly, but that the real sticks to which in this perspective is defined as the impossible. So you know some stuff about the subject, you know some things about the real. Now what Lacan is going to say is that somehow these two get stuck together. Now, there is no subject at the precise point where it interests us, except the subject of an assertion. If I posit these two references, that to the real and that to the assertion, it is to clearly mark that here, 
that you may still vacillate and pose the question, for example, whether this is not what was always imagined about the subject. It is moreover also there that you have to grasp what the term subject states insofar as it is the effect, the dependent of this assertion. There is no subject except of an assertion. This is what we have to correctly circumscribe in order to never detach the subject from it. So to be a subject is to be dependent on, subject to an assertion, here represented by our S1. Now there's something about this though, this subjectivation that occurs in a heteron heteronymous relationship to language, to the assertion, that the real also gloms onto. Now, what is the real? The real is the remainder of the disjunction between the knowable and the unknowable. Alain Badiou lectures on Lacan said it best. You've heard me riff on this before. This is a terrific way also to think about the subject. The subject isn't exactly split, divided, barred, and so forth. If it is, here's what we can say about it. When the real gloms on to the subject, it reminds us that whatever else the subject involves, split, barred, gapped, and so forth, it's the remainder of the disjunction between our grammatical selves, as we are figured in language, and our enunciating selves, as we live embodied lives. The remainder of the disjunction between the grammatical subject and the enunciating subject is the subject. And this is also how we defined it in our early lectures on the subversion of the subject essay. This, this remainder of a disjunction between the sociolinguistics of human selves and the biomaterialisms that, it, that we each have to have in order to remain human. And remember this, your body doesn't have to look like mine or vice versa, but we all have to have one. In order to be human, you have to have a body. You don't have to have legs, but you have to have a body. You don't have to have fingers, but you have to have a body. You feel me? Being a human subject is to be having your body also subject to an assertion and usually slipping out from under it. This is the issue that we're going to start getting into. Let's read one more brilliant paragraph on page five. To say, moreover, that the real is the impossible is also to state that it is only the most extreme circumscri circumscribing of the assertion insofar as it is the possible that it introduces and not simply that it states. Brilliant move. Very interesting one, one we're definitely going to be coming back to. The flaw remains, no doubt, for some people, that this subject would then be, in a way, a subject taking its worth from this discourse. That it would only be the deployment, a canker crossing in the middle of the world where the junction takes place, all the same, bringing the subject to life. That's a terrific paragraph. And I just learned the other day that Bruce Fink's gonna give us a great translation of Seminar 16. This is the paragraph that I'm going to start with when I get my hands on Fink's translation. Can't wait to see how he renders this. Moving forward here, page six, page seven, more structuralism, more name of the father. Page eight, page nine, the stuff on suffering is really fun. Now remember, I'm driving at something here. I'm driving at something. And then there's the slip, bottom of nine, top of ten. Sinai. I apologize. That just slipped out. Since Sinai came out, he's going to go on to talk about that. <clears throat> it's at the bottom of page 11 that we get back to this subject, this subversive subject. Not the subversion of the subject, but a subversive subject. Let's see what he's doing with this. Holding in mind where we started, 
we started with this big other, which does not exist. It doesn't exist because the big other as whole, complete, totalizing is always barred. Its count is always lacking. And as a result, it's desirous. The barred big other is always a signal that the big other, were it to exist, would be existing like us in the field of desire. Bottom of page 11, second line up from the bottom. Let's start fourth line up from the bottom. The drama is that whatever may be the fate this putting in question reserves for it, what the same experience demonstrates is that it is from the desire of the big other that I am, je suis, that I am. In the two marvelously homonymic senses of these two words in French, that I follow the trace. It is moreover precisely for that reason that I am interested in the destiny of the big other. The diagrams also start popping on page 12, just after Lacan insists that he is interested in the destiny of the other, the destiny of the big other. Whatever I am as a subject, he suggests, it's from the desire of the big other that I am, that I follow the trace. There's something here to do with the fact that the big other is barred and what this does for the conditioning of the subject. We are always somehow following the trace of the desire of the big other, a desire that is, of course, like all desires conditioned on lack, here represented as the barred other. And the logic of this lack is what we talked about in our series on 14. It's also some of the prelude work that we did to get us to 16. Container, thing, contained, that's what we're talking about here. That's where this lack comes from for Lacan. And then he gets a note on page 12. Somebody sends him a note. Someone who, according to Lacan, clearly has some introduction in mathematics. And then he's into set theory again in response to this note. This is where things get great. Really terrific work here, starting on page 13. Really, 13, 14, 15 are awesome. <clears throat> Pages 13 and 14 <clears throat> are basically a hypothetical experiment. Lacan is starting at the bottom, in the middle of 13, <clears throat> and he wants to say, <clears throat> what happens if the other exists? <clears throat> if the other exists, what does all that mean? What does it amount to? Far from the subject, that's where the paragraph begins on page 13. And I think it's worth us just reading this together, and then we'll diagram it. Far from the subject here, in any way subsuming the two signifiers in question, the S1 and the S2. You see, I suppose how easy it is to say the signifier S1 here does not stop representing the subject. This is going to be very crucial it does not stop representing the subject. In fact, it necessarily repeats its repetition of the subject for reasons we've already discussed. Because S1s are always inadequate and don't fully exhaust the subjects they represent, which in turn provoke more S1s, which in turn represent a little more, but never fully represent that subject. We're gonna diagram this. We're gonna really understand what this is about. <clears throat> but only because I wanna tell you about my cat. As my definition, the signifier represents a subject for another signifier, articulates it. There you go. There's that definition again. While the second subset, S2, here's what he's talking about, makes present what my correspondent, this person who sent him a note, calls this coexistence. Namely, in its broadest form, this form of relation that one can call knowledge. So here we're back at an understanding of S2 as knowledge. S1 is a signifier that represents the subject, and S2 is another signifier known as knowledge to which, for which, this S1 represents the subject. 
The question that I am posing in this connection and in the most radical form is whether a knowledge is conceivable that reunites this conjunction of the two subsets in a single one. Anytime you see the word union, unification, universe, think oneification. The one is a central concept in Lacan's work. It's a slippery concept, as we saw in our reading 14, but it's going to be one that's with him I would argue for the rest of his career, at least through 20. The one is a fundamental concept here. And when you see him messing around with universe, union, here reunion, never forget what he gave us in seminar 11. The un, the un, yes, in French means one, from the Latin unus, a unification, far out. but. In English and in German, and Lacan is acutely aware of this and explicitly says as much, more or less, in Seminar 11. The un, un, also means negation. It also means non in English and in German. So we've been over this. This is part and parcel of what we did in our series on Seminar 11. It's one of the passages we read very closely. But here, remember that for Lacan, union doesn't exist. There is no union, there is no harmony, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. It's the non-relation that he's interested in. The un relation, in the sense of Freud's un, that prefix un, meaning non, or a negation of sorts. You hear me talk about meontology. Here, I'm just fucking with the Greek. Meon, me is the Greek negation, the Greek version of that. Meontology. Mayon, meontos, non-being. Um, but we are dealing with that UN. <clears throat> Reunites this conjunction of two subsets in a single one. Read coherent, complete, totalizing. In such a way that they can be under the name of O, big O. Identical, there it is again, there's a union, to the conjunction as it is here articulated in a knowledge of the two signifiers in question. Can the big O other fully, totally contain and unite, universalize S1 and S2? And what about the subject? What about that barred S that is also part of the typology that tells us that S1 represents the subject to an S2? This is why, after having pinpointed by the signifier O, a set of S means that I no longer need to put 1, 2, because I substituted O for this set of S1 and S2. Recommendation, going forward, my fellow Lacanians, let us start using some different letters. How many S's are popping in this guy's discourse? I'm glad I love what the S is doing here but it gets a little confusing at times. Just bear in mind that the terms we're dealing with here are S1, this master signifier that represents another S, the subject, usually looking like a dollar sign, the subject with a bar through it. And then you have this S2, which means knowledge. These aren't the only S's in Lacan's vocabulary, of course, but they're the ones we're working with here. And he's adding a big O. The big O here symbolizes the big other. And he wants to figure out how all these terms, these four fundamental terms, hang together. And he's also going to throw a little A in there. But that's the basic ingredients here. You have five terms, and those are the ingredients. So don't trip too much with this. I question what followed from this as regards the topology of the other. And it is following this that I showed you in a way that was certainly too imaged to be logically fully satisfying, but whose necessity as an image allowed me to tell you that this succession of circles involuting, look at that term, involution. I asked one of my mathematically proficient pals to help me with this, and 
she wrote a bunch of stuff on the page and my eyes just glossed over. Involution, oh my God, what the hell does this mean? Four equals one over four through an involutor possible, oh my God, okay. I don't think you need to be a mathematician to understand what Lacan's doing here. He's not a mathematician. But there's a word here for us to look at. A succession of circles involuting in an asymmetrical way. Look it up, don't get hung up. Namely, now always, in the measure of their apparently greater interiority, the subsistence of big O. <clears throat> So what he's describing here are these concentric circles that you see on page 14. We're going to draw them a little differently to help us make better sense of what I think is happening here. But insofar as this imaging might suggest a topology, which is the one thanks to which the smallest of these circles comes to be joined to the largest. So you can look at this image as you're hearing me read this and see what he's meaning here. In this figure and the topology suggested by such an imaging, makes of it the index of the fact that big O, if we define it as possibly including itself, namely having become absolute knowledge, has this singular consequence that what represents the subject is only inscribed there, is only manifested there in the form of an infinite repetition, as you have seen there being inscribed under the form of this S, Big S. You got a big O and a big S. In the series of inner walls of a circle in which they are indefinitely inscribed. This is his account of what's happening in the diagram on page 14. Let's see if we can make a little bit better sense of this thing. Go on page 11. Lacan is saying it is from the desire of the big other that I am. And then on the next page, page 12, he's telling us that I follow the trace. It is moreover precisely for this reason that I am interested in the destiny of the big other. The way I read the concentric circles on 14 is Lacan's attempt to image, as he says, or to figure or to come up with a diagram of the destiny of the big other. And yet, I think there is an easier, more accurate way to draw this diagram that stays truer to the topology that we're working with, a topology which is based on the definition of the signifier is something that represents a subject for another signifier. Now, that definition gave us the basic topology that you see here. A signifier represents a subject for another signifier. Now, the big other comes along as part of its destiny and says, I'm going to try and capture all that. I'm the container of all things. I can contain all of this business. Now, what you have here is a figure of the big other in this green square. This figure of the big other is itself a signifier. The problem here though, is that it allows another signifier, another subject to drop out. So you might think of this green square as a kind of newfangled S2. The big other is going to try and encompass these purple elements in a new S2 that can then be this treasure trove of all the elements of the previous order. The big other signifies to that treasure trove, and the subject is what drops out. But this does not stop the big other. The big other says, you know what? I'm even bigger than that. And it comes along and says, I can encompass all of these in a new S2. <clears throat> and I'll signal the hell out of that. The problem, though, 
is that another split subject comes out. But the destiny of the big other is to just keep going. We'll draw that one again. We have yet another S2. And you see the process just repeats over and over and over again. The idea here is that every S1, S2 split subject topology becomes a new, more expansive, never complete, never whole, never absolute S2. The elements that went into the purple topology are grabbed and gathered together to form a green S2 that then gets caught up in the same typology. But the big other says, aha, I'll change colors to blue. And now I can capture that capturing of the first topology with a new blue rectangle here, a new S2. And the process repeats itself. Now, What's at stake in all of this? And can we, for God's sake, come up with an example or two to illustrate it? First an example, and then the stake. So as some of you know, I have two cats, a dog, and some humans up in this house with me. And one of my cat's names is Lucifer. Lucifer is the primary S1 that we use to describe one of these cats. Lucifer represents this cat to and connects her subjectivity to a bunch of hellish biblical discourse about Satan, the devil, etc. You see where we're going with this. And if you know tortoiseshell cats, they're famous for their, quote, tortitude. You can understand why this cat has the name Lucifer. This cat has an attitude problem, but that's not all she has. And that's why we have to come up with other names for her. There's more to her than the meaning captured in the word or the signifier, Lucifer. She also likes to snuggle at times. She likes to get tucked under blankets with you. And for one reason or another, we started calling her Mittens. Now, I don't know how we got from being snuggly and liking to get tucked into mittens, but here we have it, another S2 or another S1 that is going to capture something about her that was lost in the previous figuration. So we're able to capture more of the cat's attitude, personality, and the like. But even that leaves something to be desired, a part of her subjectivity that slips out. And so we have to come up with a new, here in the blue, master signifier that's going to capture what's left behind after mittens. So Lucifer leaves out the snuggly part. Mittens captures the snuggly part, but leaves out something else which may be the cat's love of eating. And I'll leave that to your imagination as the signifier that we attach to that one. But you see the process would go on and on and on. And you could do the same with any sort of a proper name. So you might have somebody that is Professor, Doctor, Reverend, blah, 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 Esquire, uh, but they also have a first name, a middle name. Um, they also might be known as Shitbird, Fuckstick, Potato Boy, whatever the hell else signifiers that you have for somebody like this. I usually don't crack up, but I just heard somebody in the other room start laughing when I ripped out that one. So it's kind of tough to keep a straight face, but uh, you can't see my face anyway, so I'm just gonna go with it. The question here for us is, <laughs> is what's at stake in this unfurling of diagrams here? Uh, let me put it more directly. Which S is the important one here? Why are we fucking with these S's? Which one is the most important one? For Lacan, and here in, on page 14 of seminar 16, 
the important S is the split subject. And here's what he says about that. The subject here is an infinite, non-identical repetition of itself. I'm not making this up. It's right there on page 14. And what this means is that the subject cannot be universalized. He tells us this on page, I always want you to have these page numbers, on page 17, just before the end of the seminar. Because the subject is an infinite, non-identical repetition of itself, it cannot be universalized. In other words, it can't be turned into one thing. This is what it means to be a subject, is to be constantly unfurling and repetitively at a structural logical level, subjectivizing ourselves. Now, we can read this as Lacan starts to discuss it at the bottom of page 14, after the concentric circles, which here we have rendered in some weird colorful rectangles. Thus the subject, by being inscribed only as an infinite repetition of itself, that's what you see here in this diagram work, is inscribed there in such a way that it is very precisely excluded, and not by a relationship that is neither from the inside nor from the out, from what is posited first of all as absolute knowledge. Remember, it's the destiny of the big other that brought us to this point. And the idea that the subject is what follows this destiny. I mean that there is here something that takes into account in the logical structure what the Freudian theory implies as, a fundamental, as fundamental in the fact that originally the subject, with respect to what refers it to some fall of enjoyment, can only be manifested as a repetition, as repetition and unconscious repetition. It is therefore one of the limits around which there is articulated the link of maintaining the reference to absolute knowledge, to the subject supposed to know, as we call it in the transference, with this index of repetitive necessity that flows from it, which is logically the little o object here, object a, this little a insofar as here its index is represented by these concentric circles. So if you want to plug in little a here, it's going to be the index of the repetitive necessity that you see unfolding across this repeating diagram work. It's an algebraic term that we use and can use to symbolize these concentric rectangles, or in the case of the diagram on 14, these concentric circles. Now, what makes all this stuff important for our purposes is that it gives us a starting place for understanding the relationship between the big other with its barred destiny, the split subject, which follows or traces, Lacan says, the destiny of the barred or lacking big other. It also tells us how language and discourse are working here. With each encompassing of the previous topography, we see the destiny of the big other as lacking playing out. In fact, you might even say that the diagrams that we're looking at here, this is a diagram of the desire of the big other. And it is a totalizing desire. It's a desire to encompass everything. This is precisely how it unfolds. It lacks and as a result keeps desiring more and more to totalize what's out there. <clears throat> I think it's also worth noting, and this will be our final word on chapter four, how Lacan ends this chapter in seminar 16. Last page, page 18, two lines from the top, and this is where it gets wild. And this also demonstrates not that the subject is not included in the field of the other. Think about that double negative. But that what can be the point where it is signified as subject is a point, let us say, quote, outside the other, outside the universe of discourse. Great stuff. Important stuff to keep your eye on.